Welcome back to Beyond the Helmet. That's hashtag BTH pod. I'm Steve McGrath, and today I get to chop it up with a man that has 13 years of professional football under his belt. If I have this right, over 20,000 total yards to his name. A guy that's number three all time in professional football kick return yards, none other than Stefan Logan. Stefan, how's it going today, man? Man, I'm blessed, man. I really appreciate you having me on the show. Hey, some of the stats that you just threw up, you know, 20,000 yards, I didn't even know that. But, hey, I can say one thing. I, hey, kudos to my mom and dad. Kudos to University of South Dakota. And kudos to myself just for getting out there doing what I need to do. So thank you very much. Hey, Mill, I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, I was going to ask that I do a good job with the resume, but it's, it seems like a, you're pretty happy with it. Um, and hey, you, you walk the walk. So uh, <laughs> I, I'm now that you walked it, I, I get a chance to have you talk the talk. Because for you to do all that, uh, th- th- there's just so much that has to go into it. Uh, but, but before I even ask anything else, th- this time of year, how does it feel? I know this is the second year now not playing, but I mean, do you have the jitters? Any second thoughts about wanting to get back out there? You know, one of my one of my friends asked me that the other day because football season just started back. It's like, Steph, how do you feel now? Like watching the games, not playing. Do you feel any like urge? I say before he even got done, I said, let me stop you. I said, I have no urge. I have no desire to get back out there and run around and catch no ball. Like when I sit there and watch the games now, I say, man, how did I play 13 years? of playing this game, getting hit, playing through injuries, you know, just battling your mind physically, mentally, emotionally. It was just so tough. And now when I sit there and watch it, I'm like, how did I do that for so long? Training camp, you know, different teams, teammates, different coaches. I'm like, no, I have no desire to get back out there. It's just, I'm enjoying watching it. I'm just waiting for the season to start to see some of these newcomers, these new faces, see what they're going to do. So no, I have no desire to get back out there and play. And how does the body feel today? Oh, man. <clears throat> My body feels great. You know, I don't have to worry about, you know, spatting up, putting no uncomfortable shoes on, which sometimes them, spot, them cycling shoes do get a little uncomfortable, depending on how long the ride is. But um, my body feels great. I mean, doing that cycling thing now, which we'll talk about later in the show, it's it's – like, I feel good. You know, I wake up in the morning, I'm not cramped, I'm not hurting, I'm not, you know, my body is not, like, you know, tensed up, because I just know, like, like you said, I walk the walk and I talk the talk. I, I always put myself in position to be a great football player. So now, waking up in the morning, now, I, I feel good. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I don't have to be, you know, aching when I get up in the morning. Oh, that's great. Uh, and it doesn't surprise me. You look so comfortable uh, on your Mimosa Minute show, <laughs> just sitting in that couch, ha- having a drink. So, uh, man, since uh, you, you have some more free time these days now that you're not playing, but what inspired you to kind of take a moment to try to gather some thoughts and, and, and put together a show? You know, I mean, I, would, I just sat down. I was just thinking about, like, sometimes, like, with my Mimosa Minute, it's not, like it, that stuff I talk about is just straight off the dome. I just, I think of something and I just start talking about it. I don't, I'm not writing nothing down. I'm not rehearsing anything. I just feel like sometimes people only say they, they know me as a football player, but they don't know outside the football life. They don't know that we actually go through stuff just like the average person. We bleed just like the average person. We have bills just like the average person. We have a whole bunch of stuff that's going through our minds that we deal with on a day-to-day basis that people don't really understand because they're only looking at the football standpoint of it. So when I started doing my Mimosa Minute, it was just like, man, I'm going to just just talk to the people, you know, let them get a chance to just hear me talk, listen to me talk about real life stuff. And that's what I do. I don't, I don't talk about like some stuff that, that you never did. Like everything that I be talking about is like stuff that I've been through or I've seen people go through so I understand what it is so I can speak on it and don't have no, like, I'm like, I'm not like, uh, uh thinking about it no type of way because I did it, saw it, so I lived it so I can understand it and I want you guys to understand it just as well as I do. Yeah, I love it. I always enjoy seeing when someone has a platform trying to use it in an authentic way, right? It's not like yeah. you're trying to do anything other than just be yourself and, and, yep. and talk about real stuff. So. 
Uh, man, I, I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to watching more of them. Yeah, I always try to be authentic when I'm on that. That's a great word you use because when you own it, you got to be yourself. You got to be real. I'm not, you know, I'm not, like I said, I'm not trying to make anything up. I'm just, I just get on that and I, and I like to talk. So <laughs> it's funny because my wife, when she, when she, when we ride in the car, when we downstairs, when we doing anything, she just be sitting there like, she just be listening because I just be rambling about so much stuff. I just jump from this subject to this subject, to this subject, this topic, this topic. She just be like, like, like she playing tennis, she just be like going back and forth, but she keeps up. So, you know, that's, that's another reason why I did my most of minute. I, and I actually like it too. It's every Monday, every Monday and Friday, they come. In. Love it. Uh, well, you, you know, uh, while I want to talk to you about your football career, it's not so much uh, while I am so happy for that, you were able to get all those accolades that we led the show with, man, it, you know, that to me is just a byproduct of all the time and effort that you put in. The, basically, the perseverance that you had to have just to get it and grind it out to have that career. So when I looked at, you know, just trying to get myself ready here, I never would have guessed that you took three years between high school and college. Like, I can't imagine a kid today would have a heart attack if he couldn't like, you know, kids transfer if they have to redshirt or, or they're a backup, let alone taking three years out of the game. <laughs> so that, that to me just means you had to overcome some real long odds to get back, to put yourself in a position to have that frame Jersey behind your head. Do you mind taking yeah. us back to like 17, 18 years old? What was going through your head and what were the circumstances that kind of set up you to get to university of South Dakota? Man, just to go back a little bit, I mean, I, I was in high school. I, I was on a football team. I ended up getting in trouble, got expelled from high school. And when I got expelled, I was trying to figure my way of how to get back in school and how to get back on the field. Because a lot of guys that I was playing with played in the NFL, where well, they went on to play in the NFL and still friends with those guys till, till today. And it was just, you know, once I wasn't on the field, I just felt like it was something that was taken away from me because it was like, I was really good at playing football. And now I'm not able to get out there and do what I love and do what I want. And that, 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 that passion, that desire that I had, that, that God given talent that God passed down to me from my parents and, you know, me taking those three years off, you know, uh, thanks, thanks to my, one of my best friends His name is Lewis Smith. He kept me in shape every summer because he was playing football in college. So he, when he came home, I would work out with him every summer, knowing that I wasn't, I was just working out just to work out. I wasn't going to play anywhere. I work out here for the summer. Then he go off to school and I go find me a little job. And that was it. So once I got the, 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 the opportunity and the coach called me and said, Hey, we looking for a running back at university of South Dakota, man, it was like, I mean, I mean, all type of bells and whistles was going off in my head. It was like, you know, like you, if you had the slot machine, you don't hit the jackpot. It was like, ding, 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 ding. I was just so excited when they told me that they accepted my transcripts. I had the grades. I had a, the, 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 the amount of credits to transfer to the University of South Dakota. It was like, all right, it's finally here. The time is finally here. And once I got to South Dakota, which is the best decision I could have made, it was like off to the races after then. I just knew it was no turning back. This was my last chance. Easy to now or never. And once I got there, I just made the best of my opportunity. And, and here I am now, like you said, with a framed jersey for the Pittsburgh Steelers right above my head. So basically you're working out with nothing. You're not really grasping to any hope. You're working out just to work out. And then all of a sudden, at some point, a couple years later, you, uh, you just get a phone call one day. Well, you know, I was working out, but my dad, God bless, God bless my dad, he passed away last year. Rest, God rest his soul. He, um, my dad, my dad was a real tough man. And people that know me, they know my dad. My dad was, he wasn't the type of guy that's gonna say, "Hey, I love you," or "Hey, son, you're doing great." Or he's, he was never that tight. He was, "Hey, get your ass in gear." Or, "Hey, get your ass up here and do it." It was like that. But his way of showing you that he loves you and he cares about you was his, his. That was his model. Roof over your head, clothes on your back, food on the table. That's the way. I, that's me showing you I love you. And 
I didn't understand it when I was young until I got older and had my own kids and paying my own bills, paying your mortgage and stuff like that. Then I really understood what he was saying. But like you said, I had no, I was just playing, just, just, just training with him. And uh, my dad was, you know, telling me about, Hey, look at this guy. You played with him. Look at him. He, he in high, he in college. He, he going to be successful. And you could have been doing this. You could have been doing that. You letting all this talent go to waste. So I had to hear that every day <laughs> for three years. I did it every day. And I just was like, man, you know what? I'm going to make a highlight tape. No one is three years old. I'm going to make a highlight tape. And whoever call, I'm going. And that's, that's like, that's kind of like how it just, this, it was like, God set it up for me. Like, okay, this is your chance. This door is going to open. And when you go in that door, you better be ready for whatever they throw at you. You better be ready for it. So when that time happened, it was like every, all the chips was falling in place. I got my credits. I went to summer school, got six extra credits, just accepted. Then they called and say, this is what time spring ball come. Uh, this is the time you need to be up here. You know, everything was just like, just like falling in place. And I was like, okay, here we go. And once I got to South Dakota, man, I'm telling you, it was like, like my eyes were just, just like, a, like it was like taking a breath of fresh air. Like I couldn't believe I was actually there. And when I got there, I was so nervous. You know, my first, my first college play ever, I got the ball and fell down. I went two yards and fell down, tripped over my own feet. My first college play, I was so nervous. And so I had so much jitter going through my body. I couldn't even keep my feet. And my coach was screaming like, hey, what's going on? You know, I do it again. <laughs> but that's crazy. That was my first college play. And I just, I remember that. I was like, oh, Steph, come on, man. You can do better than this. But yeah, that's how it was. Hey, well, I, I think you made up for it. Because if, if uh, Wikipedia is still right, I think you're the school's all-time leading rusher. I think you're, you're one of a handful of guys ever to uh, rush for a thousand yards four different seasons um, in division two. So, you know, rough start, but I, I think overall the balance of your work that you made up for it. Yeah, um, I did. I did. Those last two years in particular though, where you really get out there and tear it up. Did, was that enough or, or maybe did you need that to think you could make it in the NFL? Did you always think that you could? And by the time that's over your, your college career, I mean, you know, did you have an expectation to get drafted or were you just kind of going to see, you know, play it by ear see whatever happens? My whole, like, life, the way I looked at it, the way I viewed myself, the way I, you know, looked at everything around me, I always wanted to make it to the NFL because I wanted to be that one where I buy my mom with a big, nice house and buy the car and, and make sure she didn't have to work. And I always wanted to, you know, make sure I take care of myself and take care of your family, take care of kids. You know, do all the fun stuff that you're supposed to do as a as a as a as a kid. And I knew I would make it to the NFL. I just didn't know like when or how. So the last two years, which was my junior year, was really my my best year. And that year I was supposed to rush for like 20 when when, when coach averaged it out, I should have rushed for like 2,200 yards that year. But playing 12 games, I only played six full games. All the rest of them, I was coming out the end of the third quarter, beginning of the third quarter. We were beating teams so bad to where I didn't have to play the full game. Coach would be like, hey, you got his 100 yards? Okay, if you got his 100, I right, take him out. That's how it was because he needed me for the, you know, we had, you know, save players for the next game and so forth and so forth. So I had every, every desire of getting drafted. You know, I just knew that that was something that was going to happen for me. I knew it was going to be on the second day. I knew it was going to go between, you know, like the fifth and the seventh round. I wasn't even thinking about being a free agent. I was thinking between the fifth and the seventh round. And we had friends at the house and we were sitting there. We was all, you know, excited. We got chips and popcorn and and, and they got beer. I ain't drink beer. No, they drink beer. We just like, okay, this is that time. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. And when that last, I didn't get drafted I mean it crushed me just it just crushed every spirit I had like every bone in my body I just felt like I did all this work for nothing 
Like I, I know I did everything right. I had a great 40 time. My bench was good. My broad jump was good. My stats was awesome. And I was like, why, why, why me? Why, why is this happening? And as soon as the draft was over, like maybe 10 minutes after that, my agent called and said, hey, team want to bring you in. I'm like, all right, something is better than nothing. At least somebody had me on the draft board. At least somebody had me on their free agent list that they wanted to bring me in. So, um, you know, it was just another opportunity. And once the opportunity came and I was blessed with that opportunity, it was time to take it and run with it. So that's, it's like everything was, like I said, everything was happening in stages, but it just, I had to take a different path than some others. Some others would get a little bit easier way of getting it done to me. It was more, okay, you're going to work for yours. And that's how it was for me. And that, and, and, and I appreciate everything that happened for me because I had to grind. And like my boys said, we had to get it out the mud. And that's just how it was. So another period of your life, right? Where I believe it's Miami that you go to camp with. And yeah. so that's 07. And then it's not until 2008 that you play with uh, the BC Lions. And of course, that's the, the CFL, in case any of our listeners aren't, aren't familiar. But then it's 09 with the Steelers. So can you just talk about that three season span where I'm sure a lot of it is like, you don't really know, like, do I turn down this offer and maybe wait for something else? How long do I pursue this? You know, and then how do you go from the CFL to the NFL? I, I mean, it just seems like a lot of not knowing and kind of hoping for the best, staying ready and just praying to get that opportunity. Yeah. Shout out to my coach, OG, Sean Jefferson, which he's the wide receiver coach. I think he's with the Jets. I can't remember, but he was my wide receiver coach when I was in Detroit. Great man. He always had a motto, stay ready so you ain't got to get ready. So going to the Dolphins, I was there. I was on a practice squad. You know, the wide receiver, I mean, the uh, special teams coach, uh, Keith Armstrong, which he's a special teams coach for Atlanta. Um, I don't know if he's still there, but I, for the last time when I saw him last year, he was there. And um, he, he he tried so hard to get me on the field, but it was – we had dad drafted Ted again that year, ninth, ninth pick in the first round, and he was the returner. So they wanted to keep him on the field, but they had spent all this money on him. And I never got a chance to get on the field. Bill Parcells came in. He wasn't a fan of small guys. They released me. Went to Canada in 2008, made a name for myself again, Playing running back now. I wasn't playing return. I was playing running back. So it was a natural position for me that I knew if you gave me a chance to show you what I could do at running back, I, you wouldn't think twice because you're like, man, this guy can really play. He's small, but he can play. So went to Canada, played for the BC Lions, head coach Wally Buono. He just retired. Great, awesome dude. Um, he gave me my opportunity. And went up there, made a name for myself, like I said. Then they wanted to sign me back. So they only signed me to a one-year deal. They wanted to sign me back to a three-year extension, full contract, get signing bonus, everything. And I was like, uh. My agent called me a little bit before the season was over. He said, hey, I got two teams right now I want to sign. Pittsburgh Steelers and Carolina Panthers. So I'm like, uh, he was like, we're going to Pittsburgh still. So I was like, all right. I didn't even make the decision. He made it for me because he was like, okay, a Super Bowl team, a, 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 a Super Bowl, a, a playoff contender. So we going to Pittsburgh. Went to Pittsburgh. Mike Tomlin, for y'all that don't know, or y'all hear all this stuff about Mike Tomlin there, he's one of the greatest, one of the greatest coaches hands down because he's a player's coach. He understands because he played. He understands players he's a team player he's a players coach and I think that's what made it so good for me because I went to a veteran team and I was with nothing but vets that Mike Tomlin didn't even have to do much all he had to do was put his glasses on wear his all black that he always wear and he have his arms folded and that was him all day because the vets took over went there and it was like man I went the the uh, 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 I guess you want to say the Cowboys is America's team but Pittsburgh got the most Super Bowls, so you might as well say they're the most winning team. So I went to the Steelers. They got the number one fans in the league. They knew who I was, knew all my stats, knew me from South Dakota, knew everything about me. It was crazy. And I, 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 I balled out for the Steelers. Only thing was, the next year, 
Antonio Brown and Emmanuel Sanders came in, both was drafted. Mike Tomlin, which is the man he is, up front, called me in his office, sat me down, and was like, listen, we want to keep you, but we can't. We pay both of these guys, both of these guys' draft picks. Both of them have return capabilities. So we're going to use one of them as a return. Nothing against you, but we pay these guys, if you understand what I'm saying. Understand, they released me. I got picked up the next day with Detroit. So, like I said, everything happened for a reason. Everything was falling in place. But, like they say, like my boys, like we say, you had to get it out the mud. That's just how it was. <laughs> and, you know, you don't just play for the Steelers, though. I mean, I believe you still hold their single-season return yardage record. Right. So, I mean, like, you really did ball out. So, whether it's you, you're – trying to grind it out with Miami, you know, not getting drafted. Do you ever at any point really have to deal with self-doubt or did that not even creep into your head? One time it did. And I think it was, it was uh, when I didn't get drafted. That was kind of like, that was the time that it hit me, like the self-doubt where I didn't even want to play anymore. Like I was so I was more, it wasn't, it was more of self, it was more of embarrassment. I was more embarrassed than anything because it was like, I let my peers down, let my friends, most importantly, I let my, my family down because my family supported me through college, came to the games, watched me play, struggled to, to make sure I had everything that I needed in college. And it felt like I had let them down because I didn't get drafted because of what I did in college. They knew and I knew that I was going to get drafted. So that was the one time that self-doubt really stepped, really crept up in my mind. And I kind of was like, okay, I don't want to play football anymore. I don't want to go through this pain anymore because that was something. Football, like I tell any female or anybody, if you ever want to see a man cry that's passionate about football, come to a football game and you will see. And that was the one time that it really, you know, hit me and – I was just, I was just hurt. Like I just, I just was like F football. I didn't, I didn't want to play no more. I just didn't care for it no more because I felt like it did me wrong, but I followed my path. I talked to my parents. It was like, Hey, everything will work itself out. It's out of it. Let, let the man upstairs work for you. It's out of your control right now. You did what you were supposed to do. You put stats up in college. You was a good teammate. You was a good person. You was coachable. So that has nothing to do with you. It'll play itself out. Just wait. Have patience, which I didn't have no patience. And then stuff started falling in place for me again. So there was my opportunities. And like I said, when opportunities presents itself, you better be ready for it. Uh, so going to Pittsburgh, did they tell you up front – you know, hey man, it, no offense, but it, it, you're going to be here as a returner. Don't even think about running the ball. And, and if that's true, did Detroit do the same thing? And then getting back into the CFL, was it the same thing again? Like, hey man, we've seen what you did in the NFL. Like, we only want you to return the ball. Like, at some point, did you just sort of get pigeonholed as only being the return guy? And it's as if everyone forgot about what you did to get there. <laughs> it's funny you say that because when I was in Pittsburgh, um, I was, I was, I was the returner. They didn't even, they wasn't even going to keep me. I found this out after they wasn't even going to keep me. I was just a camp body, but it, what I was doing on the field was undeniable. What I was doing, it was like, okay, you can't deny me of, of me making these plays. So it was kind of hard for them to say, okay, you know, we got the start, the star returner that y'all had. He, he just wasn't getting it done like I was. So it was like, you know, well, we got to hold on to this guy one more week. Then when the times I played, I right, hold on, we got to We got to hold on to this guy one more time. Hold on, let's see what he's going to do next game. Star returner goes in, he play a half, then I come in and play a half. I got more stats, I got more yards, I got a better average. Okay, hold on, we're going to give him one more week. And we're going to bring him in again. All right, we're going to see what he's going to do. And it was the same thing. It was constantly the same thing. And I always say, like, the key to success is to stay consistent. That's what my chain is, right? That's why I got this key around my neck. It's to stay consistent. And I went in. After I made the team, I went in. 
I asked Mike Tom, I said, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? He said, sure, come on in the office. I went, I sat down with him and I said, he was like, he, like I said, he's a team player. He's a player's coach. He said, what's going on, Steph? Talk to me. You're like that. I was like, all right. I said, coach, what is my job? Like, what do you want me to do? Like, what am I here to do? And he said, Steph, listen, I don't need you to play no offense. I don't care if you don't know the playbook. I don't care about none of that. He said, only thing you're going to do is return those kicks. That's it. You do that, that's your job. Fine. I took it and ran with it. Then when I got to Detroit, I'm like, okay, it's another opportunity. I'm going to show y'all what I can do at running back. They move me to a receiver again. I'm like, why y'all keep moving to receiver? Put me in that little box. Now I'm just a returner again. So I'm like, okay, y'all ain't gonna never let me show y'all what I can do. Then my last year in Detroit, job at best had got drafted. He ended up getting hurt. Concussions. They put me at running back. Now check this out. They put me at running back. The head coach. The head coach, which is Jim Swartz, called me in his office and he said, hey, the office coordinator want to see you. I go down there, I see the office coordinator. You're already nervous because the head coach want to see you. So I go down there, Scott Linehan said, hey, we want to move you to running back. Listen, I was so excited, like I almost passed out because that's how excited I was because I was like, I am ready for to show you. I'm going to show y'all what y'all been missing all this time. And if you think I'm lying, you can ask Calvin Johnson, which I played with both of them. Uh, congratulations to him, by the way, for getting inducted into the Hall of Fame. Nate Burleson, which is one of my good friends. Congratulations to him once again. Oh, uh, happy birthday, my brother. Just turned 40. The cameras was in my locker every day when they put me at running back. The cameras, the media was like, what position do you play? I said, I am a running back. They was like, oh. So you never been a returner? No. So you never played receiver? No, I was a running back. So then even Nate asked me, he said, no wonder why you look so natural back there. I said, I kept trying to tell y'all this. That, yeah, like y'all don't look at our stats. Y'all didn't look at when y'all, when I was came as a free agent, y'all didn't see what I was doing. And, and that was my opportunity, but I still never got the opportunity to play running back. <laughs> they still just, like you said, they put me in this box and I just played return. I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so th does that boil down to just a size thing? Do, do you think that was the, the number one reason? Because someone could have said, hey, look, you know, you didn't come from a big time school. So we not really trust you. You don't have that body of work because, you know, you, it just wasn't division one or it's, hey, you know, you're a couple years older. So, you know, uh, maybe it was an age thing or, or does it basically, you know, could it really just be boiled down to man at five, you know, five, seven, five, eight. It, it's just that they were scared that. Uh, you know, you weren't that, you know, five foot 11, 200, you know, 20 pound back. I think it was just because they said I wasn't five eleven, two hundred twenty pound back. Because as far as if you want to say talent, durability, I had all that. I went through my whole career. I only had two major injuries. I had a high ankle sprain and I had quad contusion. One of them happened at the end of the season. So when we lost that game, I didn't have to worry about it because the season was over. One of them happened my last year in, 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 in Canada. I had got a quad contusion and I missed four games. So like it, it had nothing to do with durability. Me playing 13 years only had two major injuries. And I like I I, I sometimes I feel like those coaches in NFL, they can either make or break your career. Because you watch some of these guys that's not as good. If you look at the Jared Goffs, you look at the uh Matthew Staffords, you you look at the Taysom Hills. Tyson Hill or whatever. You look at those guys, you're like, okay, Matthew Stafford, you've been with Detroit for, what, 11 years? You've been to the playoffs three times. You was going through. Jared Goff, you went to the Super Bowl and looked like crap, and they paid you $100 million. You look at Tyson Hill, you're like, okay, this is just another uh, uh, another version of Tim Tebow. Y'all got Jameis Winston through, that threw 2,500 passes. Tyson, Tyson Hill, that threw 134, and y'all paid Tyson Hill $100-something million. dollars. How? Why? But you got guys that have been proven that shown what they can do playing the national championship games, winning national championship games, and y'all give them the runaround. Why? That's the part I don't understand. They feel like 
one thing about those coaches in the NFL, and I'm not down on the NFL at all, but I do down some of them coaches because they feel like they don't want to be wrong. So when they make a mistake, they like, okay, I'm gonna make this mistake. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just run with it, knowing that they're wrong instead of saying, you know what, we we, we made a mistake. We're gonna have go. to change this guy. We're gonna have to make him, but they ain't gonna do that. But I think they were just looking at my size. They never let me, they never let me showcase my talent at running back at all in the games, nothing. And I think that was something that not only did it hurt me, well, it, it hurt me. It didn't hurt them, it hurt me because I never got a chance to play running back in the professional league, which I'm telling you, I would have turned some heads if they didn't let me play running back. Man, ego is so, so slippery because that's what you're saying about the coaches. It's, it's ego. And if they think that you're too small, they're going to prove themselves right by not giving you the chance anyway. So it's it, to me, it just it, it all boils down to an ego thing. And, and you know, they just wanting to kind of be right at right. the cost of you getting a chance to do something. Right. Because when they bring their guys in, they're going to give their guys every opportunity to be great. Even if you're looking at that guy and you're like, this guy's just not that good. They ain't going to say that. Knowing when they go home, when they talk to the other coaches, they're like, man, he just ain't cutting it. But you don't know that. The other coaches know that, but they're not going to tell you that. This guy's just not cutting it. But then the other coaches that's looking at it, like, why, why don't you put this guy? They don't want to hear that because they wasn't the one that said, I should just put this guy. They didn't come up with that idea. The other coach did. And you know, if they didn't make, if they didn't come up with the, the, the idea, they don't want to use it because it's not theirs. That's one thing about coaches or people that they shouldn't let. I don't care who came up with it. As long as they're going to help us win, let's do it. I don't care if you made the play up, they threw it up. I don't care if one of the players made it up. It don't matter. Totally. Um, and, and, you know, I, I wanted to sneak in one last football question, but before we get towards uh, the end here, and it's just, it, you had the vision, right? Playing running back. Obviously you look natural moving back as a returner. Can you teach vision to someone or do you, do you kind of just have to have that or you don't have it? Cause, Cause I'd imagine you, know, you can work on the jukes, the moves and everything else. I mean, you might not get to the, the joystick level that some of us can get to, but man, vision to me just seems like a real hard thing for guys to ever really get if they don't already kind of have it. I don't think you can teach it. You just got to have it. If you, it's like like they say, once you know, you know. And that's something you can't teach. You can't teach you, you can't teach somebody what to run and what they see. You know, you, you teach them the blocking scheme, but you can't tell them. You know, you like okay, we if you see a three technique or you see a wide nine or you see a shade or one technique, you got to know, okay, we block this way, we're going to cut this way. But if you don't, if you don't have the vision, you ain't going to know, you ain't going to know what to cut or what to run. So some vision is something you got to have. It, it, you can't teach that. It's just, it's got to be natural for you. If you don't have it, then you don't have it. Gotcha. Well, man, I, again, getting toward wrapping it up now, I wanted to bring it back to sort of what we started with talking about cycling and I want to make sure we talk about love versus cancer. So, so do you mind just talking about some of uh, what you're focusing on these days? Well, you know, now I'm, I'm not a professional cyclist, but now I am a cyclist. You know, my wife even said, she said, either you're a bike rider or you're a cyclist. When I first started, I was a bike rider. Now I'm a full, full blown cyclist. Like I have, I, I'm, I'm racing now. Um, category, like they got categories, category five is the amateurs, category ones is next to pro level. I'm a category four now. So from five to one, you know, going to the lower numbers is when you get better. So I just went from four to five next year. I probably, next year I'll be a three because race season is about to be over. And man, I love it, man. It's, 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 it give me that same urge when I was playing football, like you know, it's something that I, you know, I, you, you look forward to doing every day. And, you know, I, I, I really enjoy it. It's another sport that really, you know, fills that hole, fills that void for me that I like doing. That's so cool. Um, and I'm glad to see you moving up in the ranks. The competitive spirit still very much alive. <laughs> and this time no yeah, one's I trying am. to hit you. 
Yeah, I, and it's crazy because you do get hit when you're cycling because people nudge you with elbows, hit you with the head. You know, they always say keep your hands on the handlebars. But, um, yeah, man, I, I it, it, the competitive spirit comes out. And I want to give a shout out to my group, CTR. You know, they always looking out for me. That's the group I ride with. That's the group I race for. So CTR, man, hey, had to give you all a shout out for the cycle. Uh, and with the, the love versus cancer thing, it, um, I, I see that in, in your social media. Um, do you mind just talking a little bit about that? Well, love versus cancer is something that my wife started. My wife has stage four cancer and uh, she's been battling cancer since 2016. And, uh, and man, she's a very, very strong woman, very amazing woman that if I don't tell you or we don't bring it up, you won't even know she has stage four cancer. You don't know that she's battling with cancer each and every day. So to watch her go through and battle every day, then anytime I'm on that bike or anytime I'm in the gym or anytime I'm taking my job, or if I feel any type of pressure in my mind or my body or anything, I just think about my wife and I say, this woman is going through something internal that she's dealing with every day, body's burning inside, where she need to get sleep. She, she, she don't eat a lot. You know, she don't have an appetite. If any type of, with the COVID going on, you got to do everything you can to make sure she's right. Her immune system is not as strong. I think about all of that and that helps me keep going. Like I fight every day because I know what she's dealing with, she can die from her, from her illness. So I know if I'm in pain, it's not, it's not even close to what she's dealing with. So when she came out with the love versus cancer, I said, you know what, I'm going to support her and I'm going to back her up 100% because that's something that she's involved with. That's something that, that's her passion. That's something she loves because she always wants people to fight and never let cancer stop you or get in your way and hold you and hinder you for doing anything you want to do. That's just, you know, that's just how she do it. That's why she said love versus cancer, which she want to say <laughs> F cancer, but, you know, she always says love first. Don't worry about the counselors. Love, love the support system and take you a long way. That, that's so powerful. You know, if there's ever anything I can do with, with my platform, you know, I, I hope you would know that anything to raise any sort of awareness for any cause, I, I would, uh, you know, be an honor to, to help in any small way that I could. Man, I appreciate that, man. Thank you very much. Well, man, to wrap this up, I got a couple quick questions for you. It's this little thing I call the gauntlet. Stefan, what's most important? Is it having the number one offense or the number one defense? I'm an offensive guy, so I'm going to go offense. All right. Now, did you have a pregame ritual that you had to stick to? Maybe now it's a pre, yeah. pre-race ritual? Uh, you know what? I, if you want to go football, do you want me to go cycle? Which one? Oh, so it changed. Um, how about both, if you don't mind? Um, I have a ritual for football. Like I always felt like when I came into the game, when I came into the locker room, I'll make it quick. When I came into the locker room, football, I was all um, in order. Socks, pants, jersey, gloves, helmet. Like but every time when I came in the locker room, cycling, I come out, I have to put my cycling uniform on the, the same exact way every time. Like I have to pull my sleeves up the right way to the left arm. I have to, it's, it's it's crazy. It's like a little ritual I have to do. Like if I don't do it, like I got to start all over again. That's why I always give myself time. I don't know. I'm just crazy like that, but I, I have to do it. I love it. Now, which would you prefer? A kick return touchdown or a punt return touchdown? I don't go a punt return. I like, I, I, it's crazy. I didn't like punt return. I like kick return. But when you catch that ball and you got some, like kick return, you got people way up there. You got to run and then you kind of maneuver. Punt, you right there you, and you sidestep them. And it's like, it just makes it that much more. It's, it's just that much more to me when you, when you do a punt return. So I would say punt return. Man, punt return just feels so intense for me. I, I'm in t- without having ever been near returning a kick or punt. I, I feel like that <laughs> just is a different level. Um, favorite football memory? Does anything stick out? Uh, my favorite football memory is when I when I actually returned the punt. When I returned the punt against Carolina, uh, last preseason game of the season, and Mike Tomlin said that that's our return right there, right on the spot. 
He's like, that's our return. I had made the team my last – I made the team on my last preseason game in the NFL. That's awesome. Uh, well, man, <laughs> I, I, I like to end this on the same question that I ask everyone. We've talked about a lot, but what's the one best piece of advice that you'd like to leave this on – and if it helps at all, um, think of like a 16, 17, 18 year old young kid that wants to have the same type of career that you've been able to have. Well, I have a 16 year old. So my thing to him, I always say hard work out of these talent any day. And I always tell him to stay consistent and stay focused on what he's doing, no matter what nobody tell you, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you may be thinking or looking at, I always have a vision and the key to success is to stay consistent. As long as you're consistent, nobody can tell you nothing. So that's what I always tell him all the time. For his games, hey, go out there, do work, and stay consistent. That's how you're going to stay on the field in a good way. Don't be consistent fumbling the ball and all that kind of stuff. When I say you have a good game, you remember you mimic that every time you go out there and you stay consistent, and that's going to take you a long way. There you have it from someone that walked the walk on the highest level, 13 years of being a pro football player. Stefan, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, just in closing, where can everyone follow you on social media? Me and my Instagram is Stefan Logan. It's just Stefan Logan. Um, I have Twitter, but I don't even know the Twitter name. I don't really use it that much. I'm mostly on Instagram. Logan underscore zero. That's my my Instagram. And Stefan Logan uh, is on Facebook. And uh, man, that's how you can find me on social media. Man, if all y'all y'all can follow me, y'all can see my page. My page is open. Uh, as you can see, I'm a cyclist. I work out. I run. I started my own boat company. I chartered my own boat. Uh, me and my wife, we got love stuff going on. Man, we got the kids playing ball. You know, we got our, you know, the girls, they out here doing, you know, doing all kinds of stuff, man. So, man, we, I'm always active, man. I'm an active guy. At 40 years old, I got energy for days. So that's just what it's all about for me, man. I watch my wife get up every day, every morning and go at it. So I feel like that's something I can do to match her energy. Very cool. Stefan, thank you again for taking the time, man. I really do appreciate it. Man, th thank you for having me on the show, man. Anytime you need me on, man, holler at me. I'm your boy, Steph Lowe. Y'all already seen it. Y'all seen it firsthand, baby.